Hi guys, welcome back. In today's video, I am sharing with you all of the books that I read in January. Welcome to my January wrap up settle in. It's going to be a long one. I read so much this month, more than any month that I have ever read before, I think, maybe. Uh, this month I read 36 books, which is wild, I know. January is usually a big reading month for me, and this year was no exception, but it was even more than last year. Last January I think I read like 33 or 34 books, and I even surpassed that. I expect February to be a much less productive reading month for me, so I'm kind of happy about it. If you're new to my wrap-ups, the way that I do this is I start out by talking about all of my stats for the month, and then I talk about all the books that I read, starting with my DNFs and my lowest rated books, moving up to my highest rated books. 15 of these books I did talk about more in depth in my mid-month wrap-up, so for those books I'm just going to be showing you what they are and telling you the star rating, and I will link my mid-month wrap-up up above if you guys want to go and check that video out. With that said, let's go ahead and talk about my reading stats. In January I read 36 books. This is excessive even for me. I do usually read a lot, but this is a lot for sure, and that is for a total of 12,782 pages, which does include my audiobooks. This month I did go pretty hard on the audiobooks, almost half of them were audio, we're gonna get more into my audiobook stats in a little bit, um, so put a pin in that and we'll get back to it, but first let's talk about some of my other stats for the month. For January, 21 of the books that I read were either ARCs or books that were sent to me for review in one way or another, definitely the bulk of them. I do have a lot for January and February, e-arcs, physical arcs, things that I'm trying to get to, and so I tried to knock out as much as I could this month because I know February is going to be so much busier for me and for my family, and it's just a shorter month. In January I actually read two books that were translated. You guys might know last year I was struggling to do that, and then without even really trying I ended up reading two translated books this year. It's not a goal for 2020, but I'm happy that it's there. I read one graphic novel, one book by an indie author, and nine books from my library, all of which were audiobooks. Speaking of my audiobooks, this month 16 of the books that I read I listened to via audio, which I think makes sense. I've been really busy and uh, that's been a really great way for me to get a lot of reading in. Ten of those 16 were books that I term shelf, which means that they were books that I had physically sitting on my shelves, either in finished or ARC format, that I got to via audio. In terms of where those audiobooks are coming from, the bulk of them are from my library. Nine of them came from my library, four of them came from Audible, one was from Scribd, one was from the Volumes app where I get audio review copies through Penguin Random House. One of them came through Libro FM where I'm one of their influencers. Libro FM is this really great program where you can purchase audiobooks and support indie bookstores, so definitely recommend checking them out. Moving on, let's talk about the age breakdown of the books that I was reading this month. In January I read predominantly books targeted at an adult audience, and in some ways I'm not super surprised. I've been much more drawn that direction lately. I still love YA and read quite a bit of it, a little bit of middle grade here and there, but I feel like I'm getting pulled more and more into adults audience books. For January, 25 of the books that I read were targeted at an adult audience. 10 of them were targeted at a YA audience, and one of them was targeted at a middle grade audience. In terms of the age of the books that I was reading, 18 of them were 2020 releases, 10 of them were 2019 releases, and the rest of them were published prior to 2019, with the oldest book that I read this year being published in 1937. In terms of genre, it should come as no surprise that my top genres were fantasy and romance. This is definitely where a lot of my reading has been going, and they're probably two of my favorite genres. I do break it down a little bit more in romance this month. In January I read 13 fantasy books, I read 9 romance books, and in terms of subgenres, three of those were contemporary romance, three of them were historical romance, two of them were science fiction or fantasy romance, and one of them was paranormal romance. In January I also read two contemporary books, two historical fiction, two horror, two thrillers, one adventure, one dystopian, one literary fiction, one nonfiction, one sci-fi, and one superhero book. 
Moving on, let's talk about my star ratings for the month. We are kind of all over the place here, but actually at the very end of the month, I read basically three books in a row that were all favorites of the year for me. And if you don't know, in my personal rating scale, six stars is what I give to a favorite of the year or favorite of all time as a way of sort of differentiating between books that are five stars that I really loved versus ones that are kind of all time favorites. That's just the way that I do my rating scale. And uh, this is the most six star books that I have ever had in a month, which is exciting. So uh, let's get into the nitty gritty of this. This month I had two books that I gave one and a half stars, one book that I gave two stars, two books that I gave two and a half stars, three books got three stars, four books got three and a half stars, five books got four stars, eight books got four and a half stars, seven books got five stars and four books this month got six stars which again is a favorite of the year or favorite of all time um amazingly i read one of these in the first half of the month and then three were all sort of back to back at the end of the month i in different genres and yeah i mean that was a really excitingly strong end to the month because i felt like a lot of the first part of it was very mediocre all right with that said let's go ahead and dive into the books that i read starting with my two dnfs the first book that i dnf'd is royally screwed by emma chase this is an adult contemporary romance that some of my friends have really enjoyed and I, I, this was just not the book for me. I listened to, I would say around 30% of this via audio, and I just couldn't deal with the hero's internal monologue. He was kind of insufferable, and I was like, no, ew, yuck, I, I can't, I can't, no. So uh, I think there was nothing really wrong with it. I can see why some people would enjoy it. It just wasn't necessarily the book for me. This features a romance between a prince who's kind of a rake who's being forced to to find someone to marry and a girl that he wants to have a final fling with in New York City before he has to get engaged and she's just kind of a regular girl and it, it was fine. I didn't like the hero though and so yeah I ended up DNFing this one. The other book that I DNFed was kind of a bummer. I got almost halfway through this and just like couldn't anymore. Yeah this is Infinity Sun by Adam Silvera. I feel so terrible about this because I love the idea behind this book. I'm so happy that this book exists and could be published and I like what he was trying to do. Adam Silvera is a gay Latinx author who wanted to write a book that was reminiscent of X-Men where he feels like he never saw himself represented in there and wanted to write a gay romance with Latinx teen boy um, with some X-Men vibes to it, which I love the idea of that. The execution sadly was not great. I am not the only person to say this. I will actually link a video up above where Adriana over Perpetual Pages did a reading vlog with this and I know they also were not a huge fan, which is super unfortunate. The world building is just really not there. One of the main characters is kind of insufferable and then almost halfway in there was a twist to the plot that involved reincarnation and I was like okay I'm I can't like <laughs> you've lost me sadly I'm done so yeah I ended up DNFing this one which is unfortunate but I am happy that this sort of thing is getting a voice and getting published this just wasn't it honestly is also just really unfortunate because Adam Silvera is such a lovely person he's very very nice moving on let's talk about my one and a half star books I had two of them this month um yeah guys I don't give out one stars very frequently so, so yeah this is the unfortunate. One of these I did talk about in my mid-month wrap-up, so if you want to hear more of my thoughts on it, go check out that video. That is The Monster of Ellenhaven by Jennifer Geisbrecht. I was so sad about this, but yeah, I was not, not a fan. That was the first book that I read in 2020. And then, please don't hate me, the other book that I gave one and a half stars to was Finale by Stephanie Garber. Oh, guys, okay, I know... Mm, I know that this is a very popular series. I have been so disappointed. I loved Caravelle. And then I didn't particularly like Legendary, but it was okay. I think I gave it like two or two and a half stars. And then I kind of hated Finale. I do have a full review of this on Goodreads. If you want to hear more detailed thoughts, my Goodreads is always linked down below. This had the same problems that I had with Legendary, where it didn't do the things that I loved so much about Caravelle in terms of like the gamified elements of it. 
yeah, I also, <laughs> guys, I just, okay, I, I don't like Tella as a character, and I hated both of her love interests, and I hated it being this, like, forced love triangle where it's the sort of false dichotomy of she must choose one of them. I'm like, how about you choose neither of them? How about you choose neither of them because both of them are horrible and toxic and no love does not solve everything. No. Um, I didn't like the ending. Um, so yeah, I didn't enjoy her parts of it. We got a little bit of Scarlet, not nearly enough. And even that had some issues to it. And I think the thing that really brought this down for me from two stars to one and a half star is that part of the ending of this, which I haven't seen anybody else talk about this, but I was super creeped out by it, it, but part of the things that happen late in the book involves a teen girl trying to trick her biological father into trying to think that she's her mom because he loved her and reasons. Um, that's really creepy and kind of incesty. Ew. Like, I, I found that to be a really, really disturbing plot point and like it was unnecessary like that could have been done differently now this did not go as far with that as it perhaps could have but I was still really uncomfortable with it so yeah I just I didn't I didn't like this I gave it one and a half stars sorry I I loved Caravelle the other two just didn't do it for me I do think Stephanie Garber has this really beautiful lush descriptive writing and the main thing that I did like about this book was the descriptions of the places and the magic and the way that those intertwined. I thought that was really cool, but unfortunately that was not nearly enough to save it for me. So I would read something else from her in the future and see if some of the character issues and other weird stuff improve, but yeah, not, not for me. Then I had one book that I gave two stars, and this was actually the book club pick for my Patreon book club this month. This is The Wives by Taryn Fisher. So this, even though I ended up giving it two stars, was actually a great book club book because it created so much fantastic discussion. This was very polarizing. For me, I really enjoyed the experience of reading this until the end and I hated the ending. I hated the ending. I hated what the ending meant about the rest of the book. I hated the harmful stereotypes that the ending was perpetuating and it's super spoilery so I can't really tell you what it is. If you do want to hear spoilery thoughts on this again check out my Goodreads. It is linked down below and I do have a spoiler section in my review. Um, but yeah like it was very unfortunate because this could have been such a more interesting book and then she did that ending and I was like why why uh so yeah I gave this one two stars yeah moving on I had two books that I gave two and a half stars this month and both of them I talk about in my mid-month wrap-up the first one is sadly Dark Dawn by Jay Kristoff and the other one is Not the Duke's Darling by Elizabeth Hoyt. And thank you to all of you who commented giving me recommendations of other better books by her that I should try. This was my first Elizabeth Hoyt. I asked if I should try something else and most people seem to say this was a dud but she has other things that are better. So I may try one of her other series and see if I get along with it better. Moving on, we had three books that I gave three stars and one of them is a book that I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. That is Scavenge the Stars by Tara Sim. I also gave three stars to Diamond City by Francesca Flores. This one I had an e-arc from NetGalley and this was really disappointing. I had such high hopes for this because the premise sounded super interesting. It's a debut YA sort of urban fantasy by a Latinx author, its own voices for the Latinx representation, and the city I think was depicted really really well and a lot of the sort of class issues and issues of, of poverty and abuse, that all I really liked and I liked it enough that it got three stars from me. Unfortunately the main character is so dumb. How she has survived as long as she has, I don't know. I think the problem with this is that I don't think she's supposed to be dumb. She's supposed to be this really amazing assassin and she's not. I mean, I guess she's kind of good at killing people, but she's a terrible assassin. And yeah, I don't know. This, yeah, so 
I mean, the plot was okay. It wasn't really my cup of tea. It's very action driven, which, you know, I'm just less a fan of. I find it a little bit dull. And the main character is not too bright. And I did not love her so much. However, I liked a lot of the messaging of this book. I liked the world building of this book. And it was enough that I gave it three stars. If it wasn't for that, this would have been more like a two star book for me. Um, so yeah, it was kind of disappointing. But there were some things that I liked about it. So I ended up landing on three stars. Maybe it should have been two and a half. I'm like now second guessing myself now that I'm talking about it. But uh, we went with three. It's a debut. I like some of what it's trying to do. But it wasn't could have been better. I also gave three stars to Rogue Princess by B.R. Myers. This is another one that honestly was like disappointing. It I I really wanted to love this and it was fine but not amazing. Another one that ew, I was kind of like in between two and a half and three stars and another debut. This is a YA sci-fi that is a gender flipped retelling of Cinderella. Um, really not like the original fairy tale. This is more kind of a retelling of Ever After, if you've seen the film. Um, it has a lot of similar plot beats to it, and Ever After is a retelling of Cinderella, and this feels like a sci-fi gender-flipped retelling of that, if that makes any sense. Uh, it was fine. There were some choices that it made near the end that I was like, oh, okay, I, like, the... I I don't know I had a hard time really getting behind the romance here which is kind of the point it was an enjoyable read for the most part it was quick and fun uh yeah the other thing about this is you I the, yeah I'm now I'm second guessing myself and this this maybe also should have been more like two and a half stars <laughs> I guess I was feeling kind when I wrote my review. Um, the other issue with this is you get some kind of erasure. I was really excited when I saw this cover because you've got this beautiful like woman of color and I was like oh cool are we getting like a brown princess and I guess maybe but we never get any descriptions that would indicate that that's the case. You get some other characters who are described as having white skin uh, even in places where I felt like the description maybe should have been pale or something instead, but we never get any descriptions of her skin color, and that felt like a missed opportunity to me. The author is not an author of color, which is fine, like you don't have to be to write it, but this was just not super well done if that's what you're putting on the cover, so that was kind of disappointing. Um, yeah, like it was fun. The story was fun and it was easy to read. I liked the world that she was creating and she's got some tidbits about like global warming and stuff that are fine. And I liked seeing the plot beats from Ever After because I love the film. But there were also some places it was definitely lacking. I, you know, if you're looking for something fun and quick and easy, but you're not expecting a whole lot, it's worth trying. But so I wouldn't go in expecting <laughs> expecting this to be like a new favorite, sadly. Guys, I really need to speed this up. I'm like taking too long. Shoot, it's gonna be so long. Okay, three and a half stars. I had. Four. Ugh, this is so sad. Moving on to three and a half star reads. I had four of them, and two of them are books that I talked about in my mid month wrap up. Those are Lady Smoke by Laura Sebastian. This is the sequel to Ash Princess, and The Bard's Blade by Brian D. Anderson. If you want to hear my thoughts on those, go check out my mid month wrap up. I also gave three and a half stars to Temporary Wife Temptation by J.C. Lee. This is a debut Harlequin romance in the Harlequin Desire line. I was sent this for a promotion on Instagram by the Harlequin publicity team and I love the cover of this. I also liked that it's a fake marriage. I like fake relationships and so I thought this would be fun and it was. I think this is a pretty strong debut. I love that we have a Korean hero and a half Korean heroine. It was a really sweet sort of slow burn romance. I think my biggest issue with this was just the length and this is not the fault of the writer. These line romances are just super short. I mean this whole book is 215 pages long and she's trying to accomplish a lot. Like this easily could have been like a 350 page book with things more fleshed out but instead you get a lot of time and a lot of relationship development condensed into few pages. So if you're looking for a nice quick romance that you can basically read in one sitting I think this is a great one to pick up. 
but I probably would have rated it higher if it had been a longer book and we got more development. There's also some interesting side characters here that I would be interested in reading more from. I think we're going to get at least one other book set in the same world with some side characters. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot to like here. I will be reading more from this author and keeping an eye on her as a new romance author. I just wanted it to be longer, but again, it's not really the author's fault. And the other book that I gave three and a half stars to, I'm kind of sad. Honestly, I expected this to be a new favorite or be like a five star read. And it, you know, it just, it wasn't. This is Dark and Deepest Red by Anna Marie McLemore. I, I love Anna Marie McLemore and I think their writing is stunning. I, the other books that I've read from them have been favorites for me. And so I kind of expected the same to be true here. And while I really appreciate what this book is doing, and it does definitely still contain their signature beautiful writing, I struggled a little bit more with this than I normally do. This is a retelling of the dancing shoes myth, and it's a dual timeline narrative. Part of it is set in 1500s Germany, and the other part is set in more of a magical realism modern day. It's got love stories, it's got queerness, it's got trans characters. They always write amazing, beautiful, queer, magical realism. The thing about this is that I wasn't prepared for how dark and intense it was going to be. Most of the sort of magical realism feel that you usually get from Anna Marie McLemore's writing was in the present day timeline, and the historical timeline felt less that way. It felt much grittier and there's a lot of trauma and threat of violence, homophobia, also racialized violence. Um, some of the characters in this book are Romani and it was just, it was a lot. I, you, if you, if you know my channel, you know that I tend to stay away from hard-hitting contemporaries or this kind of historical fiction. It's emotionally more difficult for me and I was hoping for more of an escapist thing with this book and that was just not what I got. While I appreciate what it's doing um, and I think parts of this are really beautiful, it was not my favorite of hers and probably not one that I'm going to own or revisit because it was it was just difficult emotionally for me to read. Uh, so I ended up landing on three and a half stars for this. Your mileage may vary. If you want to hear more details in terms of trigger warnings and things that are contained in it, I do have some of that information in my Goodreads review, which again, Goodreads is always linked down below. Moving on to my four star reads. I had five of them this month and four of them are books that I talked about in my mid-month wrap up. Those books are Upright Women Wanted by Sarah Gailey, the Highlander Takes a Bride by Lindsay Sands, Headliners by Lucy Parker, and The Country Guest House by Robin Carr. If you want to hear my thoughts on any of those books, go check out my mid-month wrap-up. The other book that I gave four stars to this month was Her Body and Other Parties by Carmen Maria Machado. This is a collection of short stories that kind of falls into the horror genre. They are feminist, they are mostly queer, and I really loved a lot of them. I had such a great experience reading this. I did this as a buddy read with my friend Katrina from Fabulous Book Fiend where we read a story every day. There are eight stories in this collection and I think that was a really great way to consume this. I'm glad I didn't kind of read it all at once and I'm glad I had somebody to kind of discuss it with. Even though we had different ones that were favorites and least favorites, I just thought this was a really strong collection. As always with any collection like this, some stories I liked better than others so I averaged my ratings for all of them and came to four stars but definitely two or three of the stories in here were for sure five stars for me. I think this is an intense but powerful collection that is addressing issues of the female body. It addresses self-esteem and image, it addresses societal norms, motherhood, sexual abuse, gaslighting, marriage, uh, queerness. <laughs> there's just sex. There's a lot of things in here and I think she does an amazing job of unpacking stuff and using horror and speculative fiction as a way of tackling some of those issues. And there were a couple of them in particular that hit home with me really hard that are ones that I'm still thinking about. 
I would say that the two that are probably my favorites are Eight Bites and The Resident, but there were others that I love too. If you want to hear a little bit more of this in my Goodreads review, I do have little paragraph reviews of each individual story along with a rating. I would definitely recommend checking this out and reading her writing. I think she is an amazing writer and this is actually the first of two books that I read from her this month and I think now I will probably pretty much pick up anything that she writes. There are a lot of trigger warnings and content warnings here so do check that out but if you're able to handle that I think it's worth picking up. Moving on let's talk about my four and a half star reads. This month there were eight of them and two of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. If you can't tell I definitely read a lot more great books that I was loving in the second half of the month than in the first half of the month which is <laughs> kind of interesting so I feel like this is going to be a really long video. That said the two four and a half star reads that I talked about in my mid-month wrap up are Crescent City The House of Earth and Blood by Sarah J Mass and for this one I actually have a complete reading vlog of it which I will link up above if you haven't seen it. This one I gave four and a half stars and the other one is My Fake Rake by Eva Lee. I also gave four and a half stars to Lady Hotspur by Tessa Grattan. This was one of my most anticipated fantasy releases of the year. It is a follow-up to Queens of Innis Lear, which is an all-time favorite book of mine. Queens of Innis Lear is a feminist queer fantasy retelling of King Lear, and Lady Hotspur is set in the same world about a generation later and is a retelling of Henry the Fourth. Henry, one of the Henry historical plays by Shakespeare. I really liked a lot about this still, but I did not love it as much as I did The Queens of Innis Lear. However, I think there are a lot of people who are absolutely gonna love and feel so seen by Lady Hotspur. This one very strongly centers a female-female relationship and it's got some like steamy bits on the page but it's also a very very long book with a lot of political machinations, a lot of world building. It's a slow paced very character driven book with a lot of players to keep track of but it, it's very very well executed. I will say if you haven't read Queens of Innis Lear I would definitely read that first. I think reading Lady Hotspur without having read Queens of Innis Lear would be really confusing because there's a lot of background information that you get in that book that I think I would have found it really confusing if I was reading it without it because it's already a lot to keep track of so I would definitely recommend picking that one up first. If you didn't like Queens of Innis Lear you're not gonna like Lady Hotspur. I, like both of them are very slow paced character driven books but I think the writing is beautiful. I think the execution is amazing. I will say it wasn't as much of a favorite. I didn't connect as deeply with the main characters in the way that I did in Queens of Innis Lear, but I think that that's more of a personal thing and uh, probably there are people who really will love it. And there's a lot of like morally gray characters in this too where things are complicated and relationships are complicated. Uh, you could probably do a whole review video on this, but I did really like it. I gave it four and a half stars. I also gave four and a half stars to Belle Revolte by Lindsay Miller. This book was sent to me for review by Sourcebooks Fire, and I'm so happy that they sent it to me. It's really great. So as this video is going up, it should be just available. It was published at the very beginning of February. And if you're looking for a standalone fantasy novel that's really well executed with queer representation, Belle Revolte is worth picking up. In some ways this feels like a Prince and the Popper retelling. It features two girls who switch lives uh, and one of them is wealthy but wants to be doing something else and one of them is poor. There's a lot of magic in this and there's a lot that happens in this book. It's not that long of a book so I was kind of impressed at how much happens. I, I saw in some of the reviews criticisms about things not being explained well enough or fleshed out enough and I definitely can see that. I think this easily could have been a duology if she wanted to expand stuff. Instead you get it a lot of things condensed into a smaller volume where a lot happens in a single book. Personally I enjoyed my time with it. The pacing felt a little odd just because it's not what you come to expect. Most fantasies are not standalones and this doesn't follow a typical like three-act structure. 
but I think it's really good and I think given the amount of time we get pretty fully fleshed out characters, we get strong relationship development, we get interesting world building and a magic system. The world is very loosely based on revolutionary France but not really and the magic system is interesting and the way that she has it set up allows her to also interrogate ideas about gender and gender norms. So in terms of queer representation we have two girls who are main characters. One of the girls is asexual by romantic and she does develop a friendship that becomes kind of a romantic relationship with another girl and this kind of unpacks a little bit of what those things mean and what it means to be asexual but still interested in romance which I think is really well done and interesting. And then the other girl presents a little bit as maybe gender fluid. I don't know that she would necessarily say that and she uses she her pronouns but certain elements of her character come across as gender fluid and she has a love interest who is a trans boy. Uh, yeah I just I really really like this. So it's got that queer representation, it's got a strong plot, it's got interesting things happening, it's got political intrigue and action and I just really enjoyed it. I gave this one four and a half stars and I definitely think it's worth picking up. I also gave four and a half stars to Voices from the Other World Ancient Egyptian Tales by Naguib Mahfouz. This was on my TBR for the Get Shit Done Readathon as the oldest book on my TBR. It's been sitting on my shelves for a very very long time since I was in college many many years ago and I'm so happy that I finally read this. I've read other books by Naguib Mahfouz and he was a brilliant author. He was a Nobel Award winning Egyptian writer who is no longer with us but his writing is really beautiful. This is a collection of short stories that he wrote very early on in his career, mostly in the 1930s, and I really loved them. I think they're beautiful and still feel relevant. They have almost like a fable-like quality to them, and I think this is a nice introduction to his style of writing, and will give you kind of a flavor for what he writes if you're interested in picking something up by him. It's very short. It's a very quick and easy to get through little collection, um, but I would recommend trying this out and seeing if you get along with his writing style, because if you do, he's got other novels that are just fantastic. This was originally written in Arabic and has been translated into English, so this is one of my translators books for the month. I also gave four and a half stars to My Life as an Ice Cream Sandwich by E.B. Zaboy. This is her middle grade book that came out last year that I had been meaning to get to and I'm so happy I finally did. I ended up listening to this as an audiobook through the Volumes app as a, like an audio review copy and it's just so charming. I love E.B. Zaboy. Her writing style really works for me and this was no different. It follows a 12 year old black girl who is spending the summer living with her dad in Harlem and she is a little bit different from other people. She's got a big imagination. She's obsessed with space and space travel and Star Trek and really lives in her head and lives in her imagination. And it's kind of a coming of age story for her and her struggling to find ways to make friendships and fit in in this new place and deal with familial things that are happening. Um, I saw a lot of negative reviews where people didn't understand her or thought that she was too young to be 12 or were wondering if she was autistic and needed a diagnosis on the page. I didn't feel that way. Um, and I don't know, maybe this is like a personal experience thing. I remember being 12 and it being this very sort of liminal in between space for me where I was still in some ways a child but feeling social pressure to kind of grow up and had a group of friends where we still like played at imaginative things but we're starting to feel like oh well maybe this is weird and people don't think we should be doing this because and and I don't know like I feel like 12 13 is this age where there's a lot of variation in maturity levels and in how that presents for people so I thought this was really relatable um other people may not and that's fine but I loved it I thought it was beautiful I loved her voice as a character and I just love Yubi's Boy's writing this is set in the 1980s and it's got a really strong sense of place I just I thought it was beautiful. So I was a fan. I gave it four and a half stars. This month I also read another translated book translated from Arabic. This is Celestial Bodies by Joka El Harthi. This is actually a Man Booker prize winning book and I read this for an in-person book club that I attended. Normally maybe not something I would have picked up and I'm so glad that it pushed me to read it. I loved it. This is definitely a book that you have to pay close attention to because there are so many different characters and because you keep switching timelines, past and present get 
kind of meshed together in interesting ways and as a literary device I think it's really effective for the types of things that this author is trying to do but in practice if you're not paying close attention I think it's easy to get confused with it but I thought it was beautiful I thought a lot of the messaging of this was beautiful it is a multi-generational tale set in Oman and this is also the first book I think to be published by a female author in Oman it's really rich in terms of thematic content it's dealing with gender and love and marriage and and family relationships and also changing times in within a culture and toxic families and abuse and I just think it's really beautiful it's really well written yeah I have more to say about it in my Goodreads review so if you want to hear more check it out down below but I was definitely a fan of this but I can see why some people would find this to be confusing so yeah this may not be the book for everyone but I was really happy that I picked it up and the final book that I gave four and a half stars to I read late in the month this is The Family Upstairs by Lisa Jewell I listened to this on audio from my library and I really liked it it wasn't quite what I was expecting this is an adult thriller and I think thrillers usually kind of jump right in to the action or are really fast paced from the beginning and this isn't really that. This is a little bit slower paced in the beginning. It's a very very character driven thriller. It took me a little longer to get into but I ended up really really loving it. I think it's fascinating. There are a lot of content trigger warnings so again maybe check out my Goodreads review if you want to hear more details on that and make sure that you can handle the content because there's a lot of dark content in there but it's really interesting. It follows a woman who when she turns 25 Five, gets a letter telling her more about her birth family because she had been adopted and telling her that she's inherited this house and she comes to find out that 25 years earlier three adults had been found dead through an apparent murder-suicide pact in this house. She was there fine in a bassinet upstairs and two teenagers were missing and then it's kind of this unraveling of what happened, how did all these dark things come together, what happened that night, why did it happen, what repercussions did it have. It's a multi-perspective story and one of the narrators is unreliable which I tend to really enjoy and um, I liked it a lot. I thought it was really good. This is the first book that I've read by Lisa Jewell and I would definitely pick up more. Moving on, let's talk about my five star reads. This month I had seven of them and two of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap up. Like I said, it was a really great second half of the month for me. The two that I talked about in that video are Don't Read the Comments by Eric Smith and An Unkindness of Magicians by Kat Howard. I also gave five stars to the indie book that I read that month. I feel like I've already talked about this book because I've mentioned it in a couple of videos that are coming out in February, but for, from your perspective I haven't. This is Rain and Ruin by J.D. Evans. This is a debut fantasy romance. I was sent this for review by the author. I'm very picky about the indie releases that I accept for review, and this one I'm so, so glad that I read. I absolutely fell in love with it. I just thought this was so fantastic. This is book one in the Mages of the Wheel series and I would say that this is the perfect crossover book for people who have been into high fantasy and are interested in getting into fantasy romance because this really feels a lot like a hybrid. There is a fantastic romance in here. It's got a full complete romance between a couple and I think each book in the series will follow a different couple but be set in the same world. But it also has a lot of political intrigue, a lot of action, really strong world building, really amazing character development. I was living for this. This is like everything that I want from a fantasy romance. And the relationship between the two main characters was such a beautiful sort of slowly developing friendship to romance that feels like a partnership but has like steamy bits that were well handled. I, I loved this. It's really interesting. This book is inspired by the historical Middle East and if you read the author bio she spent 10 years serving as a US military officer and spent some time stationed in Beirut and so her experience there is part of what inspired the setting for this which you can definitely tell for sure. But what's also interesting is that you can kind of tell that it was written by somebody with experience in the military. I feel like that bleeds into the ways that some of the more military centric action scenes are written but also into the ways that it talks about PTSD and trauma from being in battle. This is just such a beautiful nuanced book. I loved it so much. I can talk more about it. I have a more in-depth review on Goodreads if you guys want to check it out like everything else. I always write reviews for every book that I read um, but I would highly recommend this. This is available on Kindle Unlimited so if you have that you can check it out there but the physical book is also just really beautiful. Thank you so much to the author for sending me a copy. 
Um, it's got a map, and I definitely plan on reading on in the series. There are really strong side characters who I would love to see explored more. Um, yeah, I just, I was a big fan. It was great. Then I gave five stars to American Hippo by Sarah Gailey. I just loved this. This was so much fun. So much fun. This is a bind up of two novellas and then two short stories all sort of set in the same world. And it's just a good time. If you need some fun reading in your life, I would highly recommend checking this out because it's just phenomenal. Apparently in real American history, at some point there was a meat shortage. And so there was a bill that went up before Congress that was suggesting this idea of importing hippos and raising them in like the marshes and bayous of Louisiana for meat. Now, if you know anything about hippos, you know that this is a terrible idea for a lot of reasons. And this bill was never passed, thank God. So instead we have beef. But in Sarah Gailey's world, in these stories, that bill was passed and so now we have domesticated hippos and feral hippos living in America and we have these cowboys that ride domesticated hippos and this kind of ragtag bunch of people who are hired to herd feral hippos down the Mississippi River and it's just so much fun. This made me laugh. It definitely has violence in it too. So like it can get a little dark, but it never feels that dark. It's just a lot of fun. And I love the group of people that they sort of put together here because it feels like a fresh take on a Western with a more diverse crew. One of the main characters is a man of color who is pansexual of a gender non-binary person who early on tries to poison somebody with a glass of sweet tea which is kind of hilarious and they're the demolitions expert. You also have this badass Latinx woman who is I think pansexual and an assassin and is pregnant and that's just great. It's there. There's other characters too but I just really really enjoy this. It's such a good time. It's fun and funny and sometimes silly and a great sort of reimagining of American history. If we had hippos, I would highly recommend checking it out. Then I gave five stars to a book that I thought I was gonna love and I'm so happy to be proved right. This is Burn the Dark by S.A. Hunt. I loved this. As soon as I heard this talked about, I think I heard about this first at New York Comic Con at a panel where Tor was talking about upcoming releases and they mentioned it and I was like, ooh, I need that. I need that. And I got my hands on an arc of it and guys, this is so good. It's available now. It is the traditionally published debut of the author. This was previously published as like an indie thing and I'm so happy it's getting traditionally published. It's so good. This is kind of a blend of fantasy and horror. It's like Buffy the Vampire Slayer meets Stranger Things but with a punk YouTuber witch hunter. Uh, it's great. It's this girl who's like a YouTuber who makes videos about hunting and killing witches and don't worry if you're worried about the witches they're like murderous witches who've been alive for a really long time and they're pretty creepy so I wouldn't maybe don't feel too bad for them in this particular case. And there's also a perspective character who's this black kid who's new in town. It's set in the south and some creepy things that happen with him and his group of friends. And it's just, it's really great. It's fun. It's funny. Sometimes it's scary. It's got some really creepy moments. Like there's a kind of terrifying scene that takes place in a public restroom in the middle of the night where no one else is around and it's like pretty creepy. So there's actual horror elements in here, but sometimes what's horrific is the racism and homophobia in the American South. So there's that. I really loved this. I think the characters are really interesting and I definitely want to pick up the next book in this. It's going to be, I think, a duology and there is a little bit of a cliffhanger ending. I am all for this. This was five stars for me. I think it's great. There were two more things that I gave five stars to this month. The first one was a graphic novel. This is Harley Quinn Breaking Glass by Mariko Tamaki, art by Steve Pugh. I loved this so much. This is one of the best graphic novels I've read in a while. This I got a long time ago at like BookCon last year for a review. And this is part of the DC Ink line where they're doing new versions of backstories for major characters in the DC universe. And this is a new take on the Harley Quinn backstory. I kind of love it. She spends some time being raised by these drag queens as a teenager, which 
inspires her typical getup that we know, which I think is hilarious and awesome. Also, she's such a funny, charming character who's a little bit naive in here, and the perfect foil for her is Ivy, who obviously is probably going to end up becoming Poison Ivy eventually. But in this rendition, she is a black teen girl whose parents are community activists. She's a vegetarian, she loves plants, and works in the community garden. And this is a book that really deals with racism and gentrification and corporate takeovers and stuff. And I just loved it. It's such a great fully fleshed out story. Also funny and fun. It's got friendship. I, I loved it. I gave it five stars. I thought it was really fantastic. And the final book that I gave five stars to this month is a novella. This is the adult debut of an author who has previously written for a YA audience. This is Riot Baby by Tochi Onyabuchi. It's a Tor.com novella. And I was a little nervous because I had read one other thing by this author previously and didn't get on super well with it, but I am happy to say that this I thought was fantastic. It is really intense, I will say, so be prepared to read it. It's a slightly futuristic kind of sci-fi novel that follows a brother and sister with unusual abilities, but what this is really dealing with is racism, police brutality, and microaggressions, and poverty, and system systemic racism and it's it's pretty intense. Also a significant portion of this book takes place in a prison while the brother is incarcerated and I don't know that I've really read much that takes place in prison and has such a kind of gritty look at what that's like and how racism and classism affects things that happen there and I think it's really powerful. I know I heard the author talk at one point about doing research for that and um, he has a law degree and I think did research on what prison life is actually like in order to write this novella. Um, I also think that the style of the writing works really well. It's really beautiful. It's really well executed. I ended up giving this one five stars. I would definitely recommend picking it up but for sure check trigger warnings. Make sure you're kind of in a good mental space for picking this one up because I did find it to be difficult and I had to take some breaks even though it's kind of a short little book but um yeah for sure would recommend. And finally let's talk about my six star reads. This month there were four of them which is just wild to me because I don't know that I've ever had more than two maybe three in a month and literally three of these I basically read back to back. One of these I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up that I read early in the month, and that is Caressed by Ice by Nalini Singh. This is book three in the Psy Changeling series. Absolutely loved it, and I talk about why there. I also gave six stars to The Gravity of Us by Phil Stamper. This is a debut YA contemporary that I loved so much. I could just gush and gush about it because I think it did so many things incredibly Right. Um, and this was such a surprise to me. You know, contemporaries are not always all time favorites, but this one, I just, I love what it's doing. Gravity of Us is part queer love story, part contemporary coming of age story. It follows a teen boy from New York City whose life gets upended when his father is selected as an astronaut for NASA's first manned mission to Mars. Our main character, Cal, has gained a significant social media following for his news updates on a social video platform and is now being told that he cannot do video footage without prior approval anymore because the astronauts and all of their families are going to be on this reality television show. And it's really interesting for so many different reasons. The author drew a little bit on this nonfiction account, The Astronauts Wives Club, of how the original astronauts and their families were sort of in the spotlight of media attention and what that might look like today I think is really interesting. It does require some suspension of disbelief in terms of the manned mission to Mars thing, but I just loved so much of what this was doing. So his life has changed, he goes to Houston, has to decide what he's going to do and how he's going to handle this like social media piece of things, but also he meets the son of one of the other astronauts and they develop a friendship and a romance. So many things I could say about this. It does an incredible job of taking a nuanced look at 
what it means for us to live in this era of social media and reality television. We see the good, the bad, and the ugly. We see the ways that it can be harmful, that it can be staged and create these fake personas, but also the ways that it can be incredibly powerful in a positive way and can lift up voices that might not otherwise be heard. This is such a beautiful hopeful book and I loved it so much. It also has really incredible mental health representation. Cal's mom deals with severe anxiety and we see her coping with that through therapy, through meditation. She has flare-ups but she figures out ways to manage. We also see Cal's parents start the book with this very fraught relationship where they fight a lot, they don't communicate well, and that slowly gets worked out through the book and we come to find out that they've been seeing a marriage counselor and have been learning how to do a better job of communicating effectively with each other and dealing with conflict in healthier ways. And I love that. I love that so much, seeing that in a YA book where the parents aren't just getting divorced but are instead learning how to work through conflict and using therapy and counseling to get better at their relationship. What a beautiful thing to see. It's just so great to see that represented. And in addition, the love interest in this book deals with depression, and that is handled so well and in such a realistic and nuanced way. And one thing that I think this does really well is that while, of course, a romantic relationship can add wonderful, beautiful things to someone's lives, it doesn't fix anything. It doesn't fix depression because you can't fix it. The person's not broken. They have to learn how to cope with it in different times and that can affect relationships in different ways. And that is just handled so well where the love interest advocates for himself in healthy ways and you know like is honest about like when he's dealing with flare-ups of his depression. And um, I just, it's just so, so good. And the relationship between these two boys is incredible. It's a friendship. It's a supportive partnership. It's also got passion. And it's, it's just, it's so good, guys. It's so good. I loved it. I loved the way that this was handled. I also really like the representation of, even though this word is not used on the page, both boys are probably bisexual. They've been interested in both boys and girls. And... I like that as a representation instead of it having to be like gay or straight of this kind of fluidity because I feel like especially for guys there's often the like you're this or you're this even more so than with women although with women there's I mean there's so many like weird things around bisexuality that need to get cleared up but, but I think things like this do a really great job of pushing us in that direction. Yeah I loved this. It's a debut. It is own voices for the queer representation and it's just so good. The characters are imperfect, but you see them grow and learn through the course of the book. This is what I want a YA contemporary to be. And it also celebrates science and space and nerdiness, and it's beautiful. So, six stars. I think I might try to go to the launch of it in New York and get myself a signed copy because I loved it so much. Anyway, um, yeah, so I will stop gushing about that one. I was a huge fan. I also gave six stars to In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado. This was a audio download from Libro FM that I got as one of their influencer people, and I loved this. I told you earlier that I read something else from Carmen Maria Machado, and this is the other thing that I read. I originally heard about this book from Jesse over at Bowties and Books. I know they loved this, and I thought, oh, I should check this out. It's a sort of genre-bending memoir about her experience in this relationship that eventually becomes very abusive with a former girlfriend. I think this book is doing very important work. It's also stunningly written. Her writing is just amazing and there's so much richness to this book. The structure of this is unlike anything else that I've seen before in a memoir and I just think it worked so well. She imagines this sort of dream house that could be a physical place or an imagined place, but this dream house that starts out as this beautiful place with this new relationship and slowly becomes kind of a house of horrors. And you have these short chapters that each use a different genre as a frame to look at a different perspective at part of the relationship. So you have dream house as fantasy, dream house as pulp fiction, dream house as musical, dream house as lesbian erotica, and many 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 things and they're all very brief chapters and it contributes to the sense of unease and on being almost like on a runaway train speeding towards some ending that you know is not going to be good. And it is so powerful and I think the important thing that she's doing here 
is shining a light on the different ways that domestic abuse and violence can present itself and specifically within queer relationships where often especially between two women it's either covered up not taken seriously or ignored or people think that it can't happen and that simply isn't true and she really brings a lot of that to the surface and it's emotionally raw and painful but also so powerful and so beautifully written and it's really the story of her relationship with this woman that slowly degrades into something that is really horrible and terrifying and one of the things that i think this shows really well and talks about is that domestic abuse and intimate partner abuse doesn't have to be physical that sometimes you might not see physical signs of it but that there can be other things there can be emotional and psychological abuse and gaslighting you see a lot of that represented on the page it is pretty intense again check trigger warnings for this one if you're in need of that because there's a lot of intense content here but I think it's so important and it really is exploring power dynamics and the different ways that people use and abuse power and the fact that like men don't have a monopoly on the abuse of power and also how social structures can be a form of power which is really interesting she writes from the perspective of being a fat latinx woman a fat brown woman who has been told that in relationships she lacks power because of her fatness that she is less desirable less able to get a good partner and so having a girlfriend who is blonde and thin and white who has that kind of power can then use it as a way of saying oh well you should be lucky to have my attention you should be lucky to have me wanting you um, and I've seen this play out in heterosexual relationships as well where those sorts of things are abuses of power anyway it's an incredible beautifully written powerful book and one that I think I might try to get my hands on a copy of physically at some point I did listen to this on audio and she does actually read it herself the author reads it so I would recommend it on audio if you do audiobooks incredible book so powerful at this point I will probably read anything that Carmen Maria Machado writes. Um, I easily could say a new favorite author. Loved it. And finally, if you made it through this very, very long video, I am not looking forward to editing it at this point. The last book that I finished in the month of February is another brand new favorite that I now want to own a hardcover copy of. This is a book that was sent to me for review by the folks over at Tor, and uh, it's phenomenal. This is The Unspoken Name by A.K. Larkwood. If you are a high fantasy fan and you like things with really good world building that are character driven, oh my god, please go read this book. It is a debut and it's so, so freaking good. It's so freaking good. The world building is incredible. The characters are interesting and complex and morally gray. And I just, I, I mean, your new fantasy obsession begins. They weren't wrong, guys. They weren't wrong. This story follows a young orc priestess who is destined to be the sacrificial bride of the god that she serves and she runs away from her destined death and instead becomes the assassin for a sorcerer. And a lot of things happen. There's political intrigue, there's these interesting wild worlds. It's just so good. There is also a low-key very slow burn female female relationship that develops here it is definitely not the main focus of the plot i would not call this a fantasy romance it's a high fantasy but it does have a queer romantic subplot to it and it is own voices for that representation the author is a queer woman but honestly like regardless of any representation that is or isn't in here it's just a freaking amazing high fantasy book and I'm so impressed and I loved it and I will be probably buying the finished copy. It's so smart and guys it has a pronunciation guide. It has a pronunciation guide so you know how to pronounce all the words right and like she's given thought to the different people groups in the book and how their language usage and consonant sounds differ. I mean I, I, I'm kind of in love with it. It's really great. Really really great. Oh man, so there you have it. I'm kind of losing my voice, but those are the 36 books that I read in the month of January. If you made it this far, thank you for hanging out with me. 
and chatting about all these books. There were so many good books this month, especially in the later portion of the month, which I'm really happy about. So hopefully that continues in February. It's really exciting. I'm, I'm shocked. Part of me was like, should I be giving all these books six stars? But no, yeah, I should. They're all, they're all definitely favorites. Um, so yay. <laughs> Like very exciting. For a long time this month I was like, man, Crest by Ice is my only favorite book this month. Is that it? And then like the last few days of the month it was like boom, boom, boom. Like, oh, okay. Okay. Awesome. Uh, okay. So talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on any of the books that I talked about this month. And for your question of the day, tell me what was your favorite book that you read in the month of January. If you guys like this video, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.